Okay, so welcome to this talk, everyone. Um, I'm Olivier. I'm a master student at Université de Montréal, and uh, this project has also been done with Marc Philly, who is my uh, supervisor and uh, full professor at Université de Montréal. So uh, Marc will be in the chat. If you have any quick question, you can maybe try to ask them in the feed and see if Marc asked them, uh, answer them. Otherwise, you can ask in the Q&A. So, our story starts at uh, during the fall 2020 semester, actually a bit before the fall 2020 semester, where we uh, when we started seeing that the semester was going to be given through distance learning due to the pandemic. And we were going to give that class, uh, which is Programmation 1, and it's a mandatory programming course in our department. And it has a large, large class of students with little to no experience at all in programming. Uh, most of them don't know at all about how to program, don't know about what a shell is, don't know about Linux and, and so on. And also we were going to give that class for the first time in Python for that semester. So knowing that the semester was going to be remote, we, we started thinking and we, we thought that we needed an environment which would allow this remote teaching of programming to novices. And we had those ideas. We, we first wanted it to need no installation at all because we did not have access to any labs with pre-installed software. And, and we have something like uh, 250 students, I think, we, for, for that class. We also wanted to have a very simple UI. So uh, in, uh, in the bottom here, what you see is the, the PyCharm UI for Python. And it has a lot of buttons for coverage, for profiling. By, by that, we mean we wanted an environment which can do single stepping, but not line by line, but really sub-expression by sub-expression to, uh, to be able to show um, data flow in the program. And we finally had this idea of having shareable state through hyperlinks to be able to show one specific point of execution uh, and embed them in, in slides through, uh, through links. And you will have examples of that through, through the slides, actually. So we started looking around. And of course, we had a look at the PyCharm and Jupyter, which are uh, well-known Python uh, development environment. But those are really for professional developers, and this is not quite what we were looking for. So we continued looking, and we, we found some environment which are specific to teaching. Uh, one of them is PyTy, and the other one is Online Python Tutor. And actually, Online Python Tutor uh, is the closest to what we, uh, what we were looking for. Uh, the way it works, basically, is uh, it takes source code from the browser, it sends it to a server where it executes it with the Python debugger module. And then it sends back a trace of the whole execution, and the client will act that it is server-side executed prevented us from uh, teaching that event-driven uh, programming part of the class, which, which was in the last module of the class. So at that point, we knew we kind of had to implement our own environment. Uh, to get what we were looking for. And we started looking at which Python interpreter we should use in the browser. And we had a look at a few. There is Brighton, Pyodite, and Scope, which are the what we found to be the three most mature Python interpreter for the browser. But none of them support that fine-grained single stepping and uh, snapshot of a specific point of execution, which you can share through an library. So this talk will be about uh, what is CodeBoot exactly, how we implemented that uh, fine-grained single stepping, and finally, we'll give you some example of web application you can build with CodeBoot. So first question is, what is CodeBoot? Well, this here is CodeBoot. If you were to go at codeboot.org slash py, uh, which you can do right now, it's available, uh, you would see first uh, run evolve print loop console here for Python, and just four buttons here, which allow to execute the code in different modes. And I'll actually click that link here. And here we have code boot. So I have my console here. Uh, let's, uh, let's say hello. So hello, everyone. Uh, 
And you can execute code as you would normally, but you also have that special mode. Suppose I have an expression. Uh, so I, I hope you can see here it's 1 plus 2 times 42. And you have this button here on the top right, which says single step. And if I click on that, you have you, you have evaluation of your expression, but sub-expression by sub-expression. So here you have the evaluation of the 1, the 2, the 42, and you can see that the 2 and the 42 are being combined to 84. And finally, you have your plus 1, which gives uh, 85. And if I click one more time, you have the result being printed to the console. So especially in our context where we have students who have limited background uh, in mathematics, by example, teaching uh, data flow and order of operation here is something which is very helpful. So um, Codeboot also offers other features. By example, here you have, uh, you have a local file at the bottom, so uh, spiral.py. Uh, files are entirely local to the browser. Nothing is server-side. And uh, they can also be imported through files and in your, uh, in your console as you would with Python module. One other thing you can see here is in the previous example I gave, you did not have any variable in your scope. But here, you can see that at the evaluation of this expression right here, you actually have n and spiral here, which is a global variable. And you can see the environment in that, that yellow bubble, which we, we call the environment bubble. You also have a step, a step counter here. Uh, this allows to give a can, kind of a basic sense of cost of ex execution to students. And here, you have what we call our playground. And the playground allows you to do different kind of drawings. And here you have an example with Turtle. I'll actually open the example. And you see that by clicking on the link, I was actually able to open Codeboot at this specific point of execution. And what I'll do here is I will resume execution with the second button, which will execute with animation. So it will actually execute slowly. And you see the different point of execution. So this allows you to see the, the control flow of the program here. And I'll actually make it a bit faster. So let's go in the turbo mode. And you can see the turtle on the top right drawing its spiral. OK, so now that you have uh, an idea of what Codeboot is, uh, we'll discuss the, I see a lot of heart in the chat. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so we'll discuss the Python interpreter uh, that Codeboot uses. So the main challenge we had is that uh, single stepping will need the UI to update during the code execution, by example, for showing the yellow bubble. But uh, the, the browser will require JavaScript to execute until completion before handling any events. So we have this problem of how do we uh, go from executing the Python code to um, drawing the yellow bubble, the environment bubble. And the solution we found was actually to write the interpreter in continuation passing style. So continuation passing, passing style, CPS, is what will allow you to uh, run your program and at some point save the state as a continuation to be uh, executed later. And each continuation will actually allow you to run one more step. And since we are in JavaScript and that JavaScript in the browser doesn't guarantee tail call optimization, well, we need a trampoline for this, uh, this uh, CPS. But in our case, the trampoline actually has a dual purpose. It's also what will manage the interface between the browser and the interpreter itself. And the way it works is, is like this here. You have the trampoline in the middle right here. On the right, you have your interpreter. And on the left, you have your UI. Your, your browser. And so the trampoline will start the execution of the code and let the interpreter run for a while. And at some point, the interpreter will pause and return a continuation. And here, the trampoline can do two things. It can just call the continuation if you are in execute to the end mode. Or you could um, store the continuation because you realize you are at the end of an expression and you are in single stepping mode. And then it gives the control to the UI so that the browser can draw the, the bubble, by example. And once the user click the, the play button here, then 
the control will be given back to the trampoline and the trampoline will restore the well get the continuation call it back and then the the interpreter will execute one more step the question that remains here is what do we compile the code to uh, to, to start this execution and the technique we use is actually based on fast interpretation so this is a technique which will take your abstract syntax tree and we'll compile it to a, to a function. So here we have a JavaScript function that when we call it, it executes the code. And I'll actually give you an example of that on the next slide, but I just want to warn you first, we've been discussing of an interpreter in the browser, so you probably expect JavaScript, but uh, the interpreter is actually written in Python. And uh, long story short, we, we already had a few components for this interpreter before we started the project, and they were written in Python. So what we decided to do is to continue going in Python in a very basic style, such that we could write in uh, a compiler, which we call P2J, uh, which will compile from Python to JavaScript. So that gave us, from this Python version, a JavaScript version of the interpreter. And this is what is being served and used by Codeboot to, uh, to compile user code. So now let's have a look at the, the code from the interpreter. We have a snippet of code here. Uh, this is the code which is responsible for implementing and compiling the object.attribute construct in Python. So you have this gen attribute function, which will generate that function, which evaluate the, uh, the attribute. It takes four arguments. First, your compile time environment. It takes the abstract syntax tree, the node for this uh, attribute. And it also takes the object code. And object code here is a function which will evaluate the object on the left, this object here. So gen attribute is really responsible only for accessing the attribute, for compiling the code for accessing the attribute, not for evaluating the whole object of attribute. So it just go get the attribute. And finally, you have the name here of the attribute you want to uh, access. This gen attribute function will uh, create a closure here, which is the code function, which is then returned along with the compile time environment. And this is what will be used by the trampoline to execute the code. And this code function will take two arguments, the runtime environment, first argument here, and a continuation, on, which is what should we execute after we are done with uh, evaluating the attribute. And what this function code will do is, of course, at, at first it will call the object code function to evaluate the object on the left. And to this object code function, it will give a continuation which will call the call get attribute function. And I don't want to get too deep into this call get attribute function, but what is, it does is call the semantics for getting attribute. And, and this is actually, for those who know Python, this is what we call the dunder method uh, get attribute, and then the dunder method get ATTR if that fails. So the whole Python semantics for attribute getting is implemented in, uh, in, uh, in, in CPS uh, in that function send get attribute here. And finally, one thing which you, you, you may notice is this expression and continuation. And this here is a continuation which is passed to call get attribute. And this is a special continuation when which when call will return to the trampoline with a special flag which says we are at the end of an expression in, in the sense of the Python semantics. So through the compiler, you have those expression and continuation which will flag the trampoline and say, okay, if you are in step-by-step -step mode right now, you should pause and draw your environment bubble. So now let's have a look at a few web applications you can build with Codeboot. Uh, I'll start by this one here. Uh, the idea is that Codeboot can actually uh, implement standalone web applications. And I'll just click that example here. And here we just open Codeboot. And you have a tic-tac-toe game which allows to, to play tic-tac-toe here. So you see I have some event handling and I have changed to the DOM. Uh, 
fairly large app we built here. Well, medium-sized app, let's say. It also has this high code boot mode. When you just want the app to be shown, but you don't want the code to be to be seen. And finally, you also have that uh, cool floating window mode, which you can resize, so you can do some debugging on the side with your app running. So as you can see, we really wanted user interaction to go beyond just text input and output, uh, because we're in the browser and we want to teach modern programming to students. Uh, so we implemented uh, the browser alert, prompt, and confirm. You've seen the alert in the last example. We also implemented a get mouse built-in function, which will give the location and state of the mouse uh, to, the, to, to Python. We also implement event handlers, which can execute Python code, by example, on click and on key press event handler. And, and we have uh, multiple ways to have graphical interface. You've seen the turtle module at the beginning of the talk, uh, but we also have a, a way to have a grid of pixel, and I'll give you another example here. Here you have a way to have a grid of pixel where you can actually detect clicks with get mouse. And here we implemented a Minesweeper game, which goes like this. And, and all of those are small pixels, so there is no images being used. It's really written, it's drawn pixel by pixel, and you can play your game. Uh, and, and you can even lose the game here with an alert, which says that you've lost. And this one is a fairly large program, which is written entirely in Python. We also allow uh, manipulating the, the DOM. You've seen that in the previous example, but I want to give a smaller example. Uh, the idea here is that you have a document object, uh, which is a Python object, which acts as a proxy to the JavaScript document object. And here you can change the inner HTML of, uh, here we, we change the inner HTML of the code boot HTML window, which is the ID for the playground. And we added a button with an on-click event, which is uh, the, the event handler is, is this click function in Python. And this will just increment a counter. But as you can see, if I click the button, I have Python code being, being executed. And I see the counter uh, incrementing in the, in the console. So I'll conclude here. Uh, Codeboot was uh, was designed to teach novices, and we implemented that uh, fully in browser uh, Python environment. Uh, it allows that fine-grained, single-stepping at sub-expression level we were looking for. And you've seen through the slide that when I click those images, we can actually open to a specific point of execution in the Python code. We also allow interfacing to uh, the DOM, and this is what allowed us to teach uh, event handling programming in Python. In the future, we would want to use Codeboot for more advanced programming courses. And for that, we'll need to implement a broader subset of the language, or actually, eventually, the whole language. Uh, because for that class, which we had, we only implemented basic construct in Python. Uh, we stopped at uh, defining classes and, uh, and uh, exception handlers and so on. So if you enjoyed the talk and if you want to try Codeboot, it is available as for right now. You can go at codeboot.org slash ty and uh, give it a try. Uh, you're really welcome to try it and give us our feedback, uh, your feedback. And uh, uh, thank you for being here. And I suppose I will now be taking a question. Thank you, Olivia. We have some questions posted into the question answer uh, track, and I will read them for, for you. Uh, the first one was by Peter Koopman. What is a large class in number of students? What was the oh, large number of students? Yes. We had uh, 250 students, something like that. A few left during the, the class, but we were in the, the few hundreds. And that's one of the reasons we really wanted to have no installation required uh, because they are each working on their own machines with different version of their OS. And it was out of the question to have something they had to install. Yeah. Uh, the next question was from uh, Yusuf Watara. And it's uh, some, you, you somehow uh, has answered it yet, but I still will read it. 
we wanted the same for our first year Python course. Ended up choosing Sunny IDE. It works on the desktop, small download. Was browser-based IDE so, so critical? If so, why? Well, I, I don't know about uh, Sony IDE, uh, so I cannot really compare, but we, we also wanted to give this kind of idea of what uh, modern uh, programming is and event handling was one part of it. So we felt that in the browser, uh, it, uh, it, it worked pretty well. Uh, and there's also the fact, this is something I've, I've not shown, but I have an example here. We wanted this, this ID to be working with quizzes we were giving during classes. So here you have an example of uh, a quizzes being given during the semester where you can enter your code in a file in Codeboot right here, and you can actually directly submit it. And this required students to connect to the, the, the university uh, platform so that they can submit their code directly there. And, and that's one of the reasons which uh, made us develop a code boot in the browser. And I'm sure there, there would be other ways, but at, at the time, uh, that's the solution we chose. And at, at that point, we think it was a pretty good solution. Thank you. And uh, uh, we still have some time. Uh, the next question is from Lukas Bartocha. I'm, I'm, I'm apologizing if I'm pronouncing, if I'm mis misspelling the names. Is it somewhere available source code to contribute contributing this application? Uh, well, as for right now, the code is uh, is not public, uh, but uh, I'm I'm sure that it will become public eventually. Uh, if you wish to help, what I suggest you do is you contact us. Maybe, maybe we could see each other in the lounge after. Uh, but right now, as for right now, the, the code is not public on GitHub. Thank you. Uh, the next one from Peter Achten. Uh, how large do the continuations become? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? How, how large do the continuations become? Uh, you, you mean the, the stack, I suppose? Yeah, I see okay. a thumbs up, that's probably yeah. right. well, um, the size of continuations. I, I, I am not sure how, I cannot give a number of how deep the stack becomes during the continuation, uh, but what I can tell you is that we have a Python version of the interpreter and Python has a fairly small limit of uh, how big the stack can get and even the Python version never has any stack overflow uh, problem exception. So uh, I would say maybe it gets in the 100, no more than that, but I cannot give you a specific number. I see another thumbs up, I suppose it's from you. Yeah, and the next one from Marco Marazan, how do you handle error messages? Well, we, uh, how do we handle uh, error messages? We have uh, a special way to return to the trampoline uh, saying that uh, this expression ended with an error. And then the, the, mes the error message is just written into the, uh, the, uh, the console and the execution stops. We, we do handle uh, event handler. And in that case, the runtime environment has uh, some continuation, which can be passed an exception to be uh, to be passed to the, the except block. That That's the way we did it. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, the next one is from Alex Beppel. Why Python? Why not JavaScript as you are in a browser anyway? Yeah, well, it turns out that we have a, a JavaScript version of Codeboot I see. Thank you. I, I presume this will, will be the last question because we are running out of, of, of time. Uh, the question by Daniel Warmuth. How do students like Codeboot? How well do they learn with it? Can you compare it to previous uh, other environments? Well, at first it's hard for us to compare to previous environment because this semester was really uh, peculiar due to the pandemic. Uh, but we did have some feedback uh, from students. And uh, in general, uh, students really enjoy the simplicity of Codeboot, the fact that no installation is required, they, they have four buttons. And at that point, that's basically what they need, a, a start code button, a stop code button. Uh, we had some comments from students who were not new to programming, who had uh, more knowledge. 
And for those, uh, they, they did not like the fact that they had some restriction on which part of the semantics and the language they, they could access. So overall, uh, novices really enjoyed Codeboot, but students who had more experience did not like it as much. So uh, this kind of comforted us in the fact that we really implemented something which is aimed at novices in programming. I see. Thank you. Thank you for 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 this session for question answers. It's uh, it was an interesting session with a lot of questions, and uh, I presume the others can ask the uh, questions in, in in lunch on the table with the presenter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dmitri. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.